streaming on Facebook now, I think. Okay. Yes, it's cool. set for public. And we have. I did a quick sound test. We have four minutes till we're due due to start by my. All right. By my Fitbit, which may not be accurate. Okay, YouTube sounds good. I actually got my iPad out for a YouTube monitor. Cool. Thank you for testing that. Well, that was my YouTube channel. What's your? I don't have your YouTube channel. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I should do that, shouldn't I? Let's Altium. Go. Altium Academy. Um, it says live now, so I'll click the live now link. And um, I actually got my iPad out for a YouTube. Yep, monitor. sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> sounds good. Just I'm gonna I'm gonna close that tab so it doesn't distract us. Yep. <laughs> or turn your volume down. <laughs> it works. Oh my friend, what did it take? Three weeks. We've got Three it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't get don't get, don't go over the top now, or it'll no. put you in no, a yeah. school yard. Yeah, we don't want to. Um... No, we don't want to. We don't want to jinx it, hex it, whatever. Okay. Well, we're live. live. Okay. What well, do you want to talk about first? That's never a that's never a problem with us though. What to talk no, about? It's, it never it's is. keeping it short. Well well since we've got a few minutes, so people probably aren't quite joining just yet. Um I could can... do a quick show and tell. Yeah, that would be great. Let's do it. All right. So I showed this to the YouTube people as I was warming up. Back before time, we would make we would make our own integrated circuits, as you know. This is for the 128. And we did the 128 in five months, and the chip that would go in the board didn't exist. It wouldn't exist for four and a half months. So we would build a chip emulator board, and this is wire wrap, some of your favorite technology there. Forget <laughs> the pins that are bent because this is about to get re rehabbed. That's why it's out. Oh, wow. Um, I'm, not, I'm a horrible collector. I throw these things, right? And people cringe when they see me beating the crap out of them and stuff. Uh, but anyways, what this allowed us to do was plug that into where the chip would go. And then in this case, this was an old VIC chip with delay lines to redo the DRAM timings, a different character generator. And this would plug into the board. And we had three of these, one, one for each of the two programmers and one for me. So a little piece of past here. This is how you design a computer in five months. That's incredible. With 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 a total of five custom ICs, three main ones and two minors. So how's that for a show and tell? That, what you got? That Matt? was cool. Um, what I have. Let's go. Let's go to me. Well, let's you know, I I want to. I have a burning question about yeah. Altium. Okay. Yeah. What's that? Burning. Burning. So I love this utility when you're done. You, you know, uh, the, the cycle is you try and do everything right in the beginning of the project, but near the end, you're afraid to touch stuff, right? Because you don't want to break a library right as the customer is looking over your shoulder. And there's this, it's a tool, right? Create library from project. You're familiar with it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I create library from project and I go, oh, it's all in one place. And then I look. It's not being used anywhere. So what's the prescribed way to go? Create oh, library. Yeah. Now use library strictly. I don't want footprints from here and here and here in this network drive that'll be offline later. Yeah, let me share my screen. I'll show you. Okay. Uh, I'll grab your screen when you share it. Where's the... Sh Hang on a second. But you know what I mean by near the end, I get positively... Uh, I'm a scaredy cat. I'm afraid to touch anything that may screw up a library component on the board that's already done, you know? Okay. Can you see my screen without the Skype, my Skype profile in front? Uh, I, give me one second. Facebook streams. Actually, I still don't see the share screen oh, on Skype. I, Did you do the Skype? Skype, I'm not used to. In Zoom, we use at Altium, and I click share screen, and it's instant. And with Skype, I have right. to confirm, so I keep forgetting, and that popped up on the other screen. But you'll Got see it. it now. I'm sharing my screen now. And on YouTube, if you're watching, you can see Bill down in the corner on our Skype call and my 
uh, unfinished power supply reverse engineering project, which is going to be a whole other topic for another day, but that's going to be fun. Uh, in fact, I have a friend who works with me called Chris Carlson, who is a power electronics expert, and I think we should get him looped into the show somehow someday to talk about this. But nevertheless, I digress. So there's a bunch of parts here, and all of these... As pretty much all of these parts were found using manufacturer part search. So I'm actually using a TL494 switching controller there for this is a switch mode power supply design, just a very common sort of design. And uh, I found those using the components and manufacturer part search channel. But if if you look at this part, if I double double click, not Click wants to move. I double click, it goes to properties. You can see it came from the Altium content vault and right, it has this design right. item ID. And the problem is, well, what if I don't like the symbol? I want to modify it. Or back to your original add point, add a pad. This is actually a very useful feature for people who do work uh, as contractors, but really anyone. You may need to create a library after you've designed a complete project you should create a library from the project that stays with the project so that if anyone in future has to come along, let's suppose you get hit by a bus, you can give hand off the project and they'll have all the symbols and footprints that were used in it and 3D models as they're attached to the, the footprints. Right. So there's this feature that you mentioned, which is... Um, make schematic library so i can make a local library from the schematic or make integrated library that pulls the full unified component with symbols footprints 3d models so i'll go ahead do you and have do a that. preference um i Between i normally from a schematic will make a symbol library discreetly okay, if it's that's for a I project do. and then after that's i've laid out do. the board i'll do the same thing and make a pcb lib in the project very good yep. uh, now i think did it yeah, integrated libraries kind of they they seem to add a step later when you try and use them i end up breaking them into two pieces anyway so i'm i i understand integrated libraries but i don't i personally keep them separate because i'm doing two separate things usually right now what i don't understand so i'm in a internal build here so maybe this this thing's not quite functioning correct, but... Or it works like I thought it did, and that's my question. Firebase library preferences. So I suppose, now this week I learned I think from things, Eric... things keep with, opening with... on other screens. Hang on a second. I need to... Yep. I'm, I'm running into this thing. The Skype, unfortunately, the way it controls screen sharing is kind of funky. I um, hate Skype. My, the di anyway, the dialogue opened over there, so let's bring it here. So I've got these. Okay, cool. Yep. Let's try this again. Sorry. I don't know why this didn't work the first time. Now it's it's doing it with the discrete library. And there's some options. This is a new feature, actually, which is really nice. Um, where do you want to group components? Because there might be oh, many... Right, right. Maybe I, I want just one resistor part that's generic because they're all the same footprint size, for example. And and later on, I'm going to use one symbol but, but create multiple instances based on value. But this, this allows you to process and it, it helps it from making duplicates. So we do that and then it adds it to the project. And right. there it is. There's all the parts I've used in this design. And these couple of parts came from... You can see they've got anywhere. Vault. Yeah, they came from some some other place. Some of these came from miscellaneous devices. Um, what I don't understand. Oh, there's the TL four nine four, which came from Octopart. Your component. And the manufacturer yes. part search. Okay. So let's say I make some changes, and back now I'm in my. Um, power supply design and I I realize if I look at the properties of this part it's still pointing back let's go to properties panel it's still pointing back to the original source so I could change that individually 
to my local library that's been added to the project or I want to do all of them. So the way you do that is we go find similar objects on the right mouse button menu. And that's what Part I was same. going to ask. We're going to look yep. for all open project documents. Click OK. It selects all the parts. And then when I click source, I can click the browse button and choose my local schematic library. And then this is an important option. Do you want to remove the existing part IDs and s select it later? Or do you want to keep them the same? So what the part ID is, is essentially the name of this specific manufacture a part in this library now if i made the library from the design they probably don't need to change because they're going to be the same as what they originally were but if i'm moving parts to say my own big central library later on it would be better for me to to do clean right but i'll just say do not right. change for now because it's easier and what that means is now when i look at this let's clear that highlight if i look at this individual tl494 it's now it's got the same design item id that was duplicated from the vault right but it's now right, it's right, now right. coming from i just deselected it there it's now coming from my local project library so uh, and then that means if i do make changes in the library and change a bunch of footprints or things or modify some symbols to be meet my preference uh, later on, I can go tools, update, update from libraries, and it will update from the local project libraries now instead of the, the cloud. Okay. Um, and do so, you have to do this to every page? Let's say this was a 10-page no, schematic. Would you have to do this 10 times? No, that find similar objects. If I, if I go to find similar objects and choose part and choose project documents down here, and select okay. it will it will select every component in every schematic sheet if it's a multi-sheet design so i don't need to worry about that it can it will do them all in one hit uh, of course good. now now there's a downside there's pros and cons to everything the con of doing things this <laughs> way is my whole design and all the parts in it are no longer linked at all to the content in octopart and what I mean is I can no longer update if if Altium were to provide an updated symbol or footprint with a better 3D model, then when I do an update from libraries, it's not looking there anymore. So I lose that connection. However, but you, I but still you, have... I was to say that's safer, though, if you're paranoid. That means that you won't get a change later that slipped in under the covers and you missed it. Right. And I, I've retained all the parameters. You see here this list of parameters in the component properties. I still have right. I still have the official footprint. I still have all the manufacturer data that's added to the parameters in the database. I still have the link to the data sheet. So I don't lose any of that useful information that is needed during design and also later on in the bill of materials. So, so the one thing I'll add is I leave the CMP name in there just as you did until I herdify the component. Once I've gone in and I blessed it, then I give it a meaningful name. And that's also my cue to myself where that I've now touched it. So the CMPs are like a footprint. Yeah. Herdification. That's a new we've we've come up with a new term. Well, we've there's heard. Altium and I's, but that it doesn't quite flow as well. No. You know, it's herdified. I like that. <laughs> It's been herded. It's, it, yeah, it, it kind of means coagulate, you know, and who, who oh, don't get me going on that. So, so um, very cool. I just learned to do part replacement because I fell into the old trap where I swapped a part. And, of course, it, on the PC board, it, plot, you know, took it off the board. And so today, and this is really cool about Audi. I mean, you heard me talk about this uh, last week. When you go there to the tech support area, a chat box starts. So here I am chatting. Eric with CH is one of the people. But they're actually answering stupid little – they're not doing stupid answers, but I'm asking stupid questions. And Eric was able to tell me in real time, no, no, do exactly what you just said. And so I got better at doing the replace parts because the problem I always had is when I select a bunch of parts – and then I modify something in the properties panel. It only does the last part I selected. And I'm still trying to figure out when that, it's like 
there'll be eight blue boxes and a green one, and it only does the green box, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, uh, just a just a real quick. I I must apologize to Eric Allbach. Actually, I I know Eric is actually a customer of Altium, and Altium Eric, who you were on the chat to, who had twelve chats going, is a different Eric. <laughs> and I wanted I wanted to let you know, Bill, because you made this praiseworthy comment that he was really juggling a lot of um, support questions online and doing a terrific job. I want you to know he just won a, a prize internally for the Altium. It's this thing we have called Altium Ambassador. Someone who really goes above and beyond, and they get they get like an actual prize given to them by HR that's pretty decent. And uh, okay. a lot of recognition in the company. So I thought you might be really thrilled to know that. Um, That's cool. Here and yeah. And your words, of course. I, I, got are... a, I got a prize from when I was at your Audium Live event that I still use. It's it's a, an Alexa, which I never would have bought because of my paranoia. And we sat in the hotel room that night, plugged in Alexa and listened to classic rock on the on the porch, watching the waves come in. It was just a wonderful night. Night. And so I still have my 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 prize that Judy gave me. So thank you, Judy. (laughs) Yeah. So So. um, we started out with with your show and tell, which is cool. I've got a little show and tell as well. Show me what you got, man. Um, And this is exciting for me. I've kind of wanted one of these for years and put off getting it because I haven't been able to justify it, but I just found there's a lot available, really. You were talking about building your lab using eBay. Well, I'm I'm working on it, so... Oh, it's bloody heavy. This is... Let's see, can you see that all right? Is that a listen? Is that a listen, L-I-S-N, or... Oh, it's a high pot tester. This... Oh, you're a maniac. This is a road... Oh, you're going to be ruining stuff. The refrigerator is going to break. The TV. Does your yes. wife know you have that? No. Oh, Don't man. Don't tell her. I've wanted <laughs> one of these for years. When I... Um... Some of the worst practical jokes in the world were done with high pot testers. Yeah. So this one, um, fortunately, I found... At, at least they provide quick start guides. Rod L is still... They're still making these, and they provide quick start guides as a download from their website. And uh, I managed to find an old, I think, 1992-ish user manual, which has all the calibration procedures and everything in it. So um, so you can stay tuned for some kind of episode or video where I'm going to interrogate a cheap Chinese power supply or two with this thing. We'll see if they, I, I can see we'll it. see if they're really actually safe or not. We're gonna. I, I can see it. You'll push the button and then just go off the air, and we hear about a power outage in San Diego <laughs> or something. All right, I'll, I'll match you. This was in deplorable condition, and I had to buy a new case for it, which cost me two hundred. But I rebuilt a, an LISN, and this is off eBay. This only cost two hundred dollars, and it's for doing conducted emissions tests. Oh, that's you're, cool. You're, you, right. And yeah. and so um, this could test the same power supply you're talking about. Maybe we should do something like that, right? Yeah. Um, because this, what this does is it, it's a big-ass inductor that isolates the power supply from the wall. And so any noise I observe is strictly from the power supply. That's the easiest way to describe yeah. it. So it keeps, well, I yeah, love this keeps thing. The I haven't used out. it yet. but. <laughs> <laughs> These are these are a lot of fun. I have used high pot testers before, but not this particular brand. Yeah. Um, and uh, and just for those who don't really know, um, it's, yeah, describe it's, a high pot tester. It's not the machine the police use to tell if you're high when they pull you over. It's not a pot. No. It's not a pot high tester. High pot's short for high potential, and basically the idea is. If you're if you're designing an offline power supply or any kind of product that connects to household mains or building electricity, it must be safety isolated from end users, or have suitable insulation uh, and and protection or earthing, and so there's all these tests you have to do to make sure it complies with all the safety standards. And the high pot tester subjects you you basically put all the inputs your live and neutral inputs on the power supply 
are tied together and pulled up to a very high voltage, high potential. And the ground connector on your power supply and the outputs are all tied together to a ground return and it subjects, you, you can adjust the voltage, it's got a very act dial on the back and I can set trip points for maximum and minimum allowable or maximum allowable current and it tests by subjecting AC high voltage to the input side of the supply and the output and it measures the current and if there's any leakage it sets an alarm if it if the leakage is beyond your maximum allowable safe current and you know all it takes is 10 milliamps to cause a human to go into cardiac arrest so a lot of devices have their safety earthing and, and insulation standards have to it depends which country you're in and what standards you have to meet but um, yeah, I have a IEC 801 standard. Or I, I've got the name all wrong, but it's the famous finger test. Oh, it, yeah. It, it, it'll do the, the electrostatic shock up to like 25 kV, I think. Yeah. Um, and people will try and take the starter off of, the, off of your gas grill and go, oh, that's just as good. And no, it's not. It, 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 the result's meaningless without, as you said, a way to manage the current. And you have to be able to measure it. And measuring it. Yep. Yes. Because the only way to write a standard is to actually define specific limits. And those limits aren't arbitrary. They're based on scientific research as to what it causes to start a fire, what it causes to cause pain, what it causes to cause injury to a human. All of that's been well researched. So we know how much current exactly is based on a, a very small, tight bell curve that humans right. are subjected to from actual testing. And so, yeah, these standards are kind of important. So, yeah, I'm going to have some fun with that. At uh, first, I don't even know if it's in Cal. I don't know if it f is fully functional. So I'm going to do a whole other video sometime. That's cool. On um, doing I, a teardown. and story. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I know, what's... your time's your twenty minutes is coming up here for yeah. your show and tell or the big thing. Um, but as you know, I, I used to work in a trauma center, and we've gotten some of the high tension voltage guys in where they'll have a burn on the bottom of their foot or a burn right into their palm, and the high voltage is also also has a frequency component, and it'll travel up your bone marrow and just kill it. Right? It's just nasty, and you end up with a little slug of dead skin that'll fall out. Well, we had a guy come in, and he had been knocked flat. Every, he was witnessed, right? But he was working on a printer, a big line printer. And he got knocked right. on his tail end. And I'm there, and we're, you know, he's actually okay, and we're trying to figure out what happened. I said, wait a minute, wait, wait. I said, was there like this tinsel, this Christmas tree tinsel hanging off the back of this big printer? Was it like a big noisy printer? He goes, yeah, yeah. I said, the tinsel, and he said, well, we just took it off. And I go, I know what happened. Static electricity knocked him on his tail. They had to taken the tinsel off, which is there to discharge the paper as it rubs on its way through. Oh, my gosh. He gets behind there, touches it, the accumulated charge of, I don't know, 100 sheets of paper, and just knocked him on his tail. And so it's the biggest case of static. And we're expecting high voltage with the way it was tapped out. We're <laughs> expecting alignment, you know, after he's been hanging on the line or something. So static can sorry actually, for the story, but uh, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean, it can this. it can actually give you a big jolt. Um, yeah, I've hey, I have another story. Yeah. OK, I'm sorry, but you've heard of the Macintosh, right? The computer or the Apple? The computer Macintosh, <laughs> not the Apple. Well, of it's course. An Apple. So I met the mechanical designer of the Macintosh case, right? Well, the Mac Classic, the original one. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we, the, call and, and the, we call those doorstops. We call those doorstops in Australia. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, if you work for Apple, I'm, I'm not. I'm just telling you. Well, a joke. I wish I'm I not could trying remember to the be offensive. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could remember his name right now. But we ended up like looking it over, and we're saying the same things. We're talking, oh, the Pantone color, oh, the finger test, oh, this is a blind insert. You need a tool, and we're both leaning over the Macintosh like two kids going over it. And we had the same goal. This guy was dead serious. Because, you know, in a Macintosh is, is a high voltage picture tube. I mean, yes. it might only be 12,000 volts. But oh, that'll give you quite the jolt. Oh, it'll knock you on your tailbone. They will. And 
he didn't want somebody to unwrap a paper clip, stick it in there and hit the P2 button and get knocked. And I told him, I said two things. I said, uh, well, the, the one thing was, you know, thank you. I, I said, you're as dedicated and passionate about this as we were, right? Uh, that he's trying to be that safe. And then later I was telling the, the guy that ran the BCF Southeast and I said, I, I had a great time with the Apple engineer. Oh my God, I've never said that before. <laughs> you know, so I actually found an Apple engineer I liked. So oh, I'm this... sorry, there's another story for you. Well, actually, but it was you know, a finger I, test we were talking about. I feel like any any big successful company, but particularly one with a great history like Apple, is going to attract fantastic engineers. I'm sure I've, I've met some of them. There are some really excellent people there, just like there are in any large successful company. You're going to find some pretty especially in technical roles. You often find really good people. Right. Um, but good people are everywhere if you're willing to look for them, if your eyes are open. <laughs> so, yes. Hey, it's 20 minutes after, so we said that that'd be a time for you do, to do an Altium thing if, if you didn't already well, show I did your or, Well, I did already. You asked me about the... You did? So I don't know. What well, else do you want to know? Well, you do you want have to any show other questions? how to do a query? Oh, queries. How do you do a query? Okay. Or All you right. want to save that one for 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 the no, actually, a actually, it it's really easy, and I will show you because it's a it's a very okay. very useful thing to know. So I'm going to switch back to sharing my desktop. Uh, and on. I'm going to make you full screen. And and to everybody who wonders why I keep bringing up Altium, this is my chance to learn from an expert. So I'll just go ahead and put that on the record there. So. Um, Okay, what did you want to know? Query. Uh, so, Queries. So, so um, the way... Make a query that's like U1 and U2 or something like that. How do I first string a couple things together? Let's do say you want I to want do it to on the board, change... side? board side or schematic? Because it works anyway. Uh, so let's here's, go board side. Here's the thing. In, in designing electronics, on, either in schematic or in PCB, you frequently come up against this need to change a whole lot of things in some specific yes. way. And you don't want to do it bit by bit. You don't want to have to go around double clicking on every single trace and make it narrower. So let's say I'm going to a new PCB fab and I need to, for, for whatever their oh, hey, process. Share, share your other screen on Skype, please. I am. You're, you're still showing the schematic on Skype. Uh, maybe there's some delay, but I switched. I switched to PCB. Okay. You should be seeing that. There's probably some delay in sh screen sharing in Skype. Okay. Um, on YouTube, we're looking at my my PCB. Should be seeing it on Skype as well. No, nope, not yet. Uh, let me see if you have a, a second screen share, no, and I need to find I'm it. I'm going to stop and restart sharing the screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? And I'm moving the board around. You're seeing. I see a... you on Skype, but I'm not seeing you in XSplit. But continue talking, and I'll get you hooked up here. This only affects my stream. And there you are. I got you. Very okay. cool. Okay, keep cool. Up. So keep here's, up. here's the deal. I've got all these tracks, and uh, there's the straight line segments, and there's arcs, right, on this design. And if I look at the properties right. of any of those there... They're the default 10 mil trace. So first of all, let me really quickly check my design rules for this design because I ought to be able to go less than that. So let's go to routing width rule. One uh, of the biggest compliments I've ever received seven. was from was from you. And you said, oh, I noticed you had all your design rules checked off. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so here's, here's the thing. Let's say I wanted to make all the tracks not... 10 mil, but eight, because I'm going to, I just want to increase the amount of space I have around the place in case I need to rate, run some additional routing or something. It's kind of a BS scenario, but you know what I mean? Like, right, so let's right. write, well, I'll use that find similar objects again. Now, what I could do instead of that is there's a filter panel and to open it, you go panels, PCB filter, and you, there's this area here that's a little box for typing in what's called the query language. And the nice thing about this is it gives you code completion. So it it hints it to, 
if you start typing something, it gives you hints as to what you might be referring to. And so here's a good example down here. I have this ground trace. No, I don't, I don't actually want that. So I need to make some extra room around here so maybe I can redo that better so there's not a net antenna problem there. Okay, but um, so I could say, well, is there's all these queries that begin with is, and this is an object type check. You can have class or object group membership checks. So there's in, is queries, in queries. So if an object is in any component and I click, um, I click to say let's mask, so that will highlight them and zoom to them and click apply. It's going to show me all the objects that belong within a component. And those are naturally pads, 3D cool. bodies, and silkscreen objects and holes that belong within components, right? Or you could say right, in, right. Uh, let's say, in differential pair or whatever. Okay, so is is another one. Is, I could say is track. Is that right? Is... So it gives me this code completion kind of thing, right? So it gives you hints, and there's all the normal Boolean operators like or, and, not. And so if you want to say if if it's in a track, it's it's giving me all that. But of course, it didn't pick up all the curvy bits. Why? Because those in Altium... Those are arcs. Altium's object hierarchy, those are arcs. So I could say is track yeah. or is arc now they're not selected they're just it's just highlighting them for me with the filter engine right 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 so what i actually want to do is check select and i could do it that way and so okay. you, you can use this as a tool if you want to become a ninja you use this tool um to create queries because it helps you and of course there's ah, a query okay there's a query helper as well and it lets you test your syntax to make sure if you start doing much more complex ones, you can see all the different operators are available for equality tests, greater than, less than tests. Anything that results in a true or false can be used. And so, and it gives you all the like library of functions that are available in, and it's context sensitive. So if I'm in a library, it'll give me a subset of this. If I'm in a schematic, it'll give me all schematic objects and so on. Now, if um, let's clear that, clear that, and you'll notice that I selected all the tracks or I highlighted all the tracks and arcs there. Uh, but I don't want to. What I want to do is take all the signals and make them seven mil traces. But okay. I don't want to okay. do it. I don't want to do it for the power and ground. And right. so what I'm going right. to do is show you now the other way other than using the filter panel and manually typing in a query you can let's zoom in so i'm right clicking on something here i can go find similar objects right and that opened on my other screen so i'll bring that over and it says object kind track because that's the object i right clicked over now i'm i want to do more than just tracks let's say uh let's say i want to do I don't need to do tracks. I want to do anything, but let's say it's on the top layer and here's the, here's the interesting thing. I could go by net, but I don't want just that net, right? Or maybe I do just want that one net, but I could do, I can type in this field, right? So I could either click the drop down and pick any of those nets on the design or I could do star to mean any so wildcards work or I could type in I don't know some other qu query subset that is like a textual filter so I could do P star so let's say I want all the peripheral nets so anything beginning with P but ending in whatever is going to be highlighted and then I can check this box create expression so not only will this select and highlight all those objects I'm talking about it will also create an expression and put it in this box over here so let's do that 
Click OK. It runs the query, does the selection, right? Wow. And wow. it gives me the query over here so I can reuse it. And there's one thing even better than that. I can now say, well, I want to apply a new design rule to all of those. Wow. Right, right, right. So now, now I'm going to say create rule and say, well, I'm going to make a new width constraint just for all those peripheral IOs. And that is going to give me a preferred width of actually seven mils and a max width of 10. Now I'm not actually editing the traces at this point. I'm only changing a design rule so that right. if I were to reroute them, it would, it would select the seven mil next time instead of the 10 because of my rule preference. But now, now are now, you able to, well, first, to change it uh, yeah. across the board without? Okay, go yeah, ahead. Yes, so that's the next thing. I do want to change all of these to be seven mil traces. And so uh, w they're all still selected. So all I have to do is go over here into the properties panel, which uh, gives me the common attributes of everything that's selected. And it's uh, there are some other items in there that should not be part of that query. So I didn't realize that the um, it only showed the it's common given me, it's given attributes. Me, it's, That's really interesting. It's giving me pads, and I don't want the pads. So I'm going to filter one more level, but this time I'm going to filter using the properties panel. At the top here, I can actually create a post selection filter, and I'm going to undo that and do just tracks and arcs. And now okay. it's showing me the common attributes of all the selected tracks wow. and arcs. Okay. So I can actually go in here and delete that 10 and make it seven and boom. They're all seven oh, mils. Cool. All of those are seven yep. mils. They're all in exactly the same place. And naturally because they're routed endpoint to endpoint, uh, to snapped to the center of objects, I don't get any gaps or anything like that, right? So this works perfectly for kind of bulk trace editing. But you can apply that process to any kind of t class of object in Altium Designer's UI. It's extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. Yeah. You, you select, yes. and of course, there's even easier ways of doing it now. I could use the selection filter. Of course, what I just did. I could say, let's just give me tracks and arcs as a pre-selection filter, and I could go like this. The, of course, the problem is I'm now selecting everything that's in the power nets as well, and I don't want right, to change right. those. So I'd still have to do some manipulation of my selection, and so the query language is, is still an extremely useful thing. And this this is probably the best way for any new user to go about setting up design rules because you can actually, while you're visually looking at the object you want to create a rule for, you can say, I need a rule for all the objects like this one. Right. So, yeah. And and and, and yet it's probably one of the scariest tools, right? It, it's one of the more useful and one of the scariest to a new person. Yeah, and it's... Or at least I think so. It can be, but... You don't have to be a coding guru like some people see the scripting system and get intimidated. The, the truth is there are many far more complicated things you will do as a PCB designer than that. And right, this is, right. No, this I, is it's, going it's, to accelerate that's why your configuration. We're talking about it. Yeah. Yep. So because I'll, it I'll, is such a useful tool. I'll, I'll stop sharing that now. Uh, I don't know. if, it, if it, Were there any other cool things we could chat about? Do you have a... Any... One quick thing then. Yep. So uh, you talk about collecting test equipment and whatnot. Yep. Alan Wolk, who is also known as W2AEW, we just had this up in Hackaday where I do some contributions. And he's got a, he talks about VNAs. I don't know if you want to Google them or whatnot, yeah. but Google Alan Wolk VNA, and he actually has a very good video on cheap VNAs, $50 VNAs. No way. I will check yeah, that out. You, I'm telling you, Google it so, right now. So it's, far, it's, it's I'm, worth it. I'm using, let's see if the USB cable's long enough to pull it over. I'm using the okay, mini. Okay, you got one. The All mini right. VNA Tiny. So this, when I bought this, it was, these are a bit cheaper now than they were. They've kind of flooded the market. They are pretty good. I'd say they're, they're enough for any ham radio operator or um, What's hobbyist. What's your frequency, Max? 
This one will go up to three gigahertz. Okay. Okay. So you can do Wi-Fi. You can do Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and that's so you and and it's only a two-port VNA. So I can't hook up my Wilkinson divider to a third port and look at the S31. Unfortunately, I'd really like a right. four-port VNA that'll go up to six gigahertz for what I'm doing, but. Um, it's it's pretty tough getting approval for Altium to buy me one of those. So <laughs> I guess I'm just I'm just going to keep working on my RF and microwave PCB design series until someone decides to sponsor me. I I just looked for my VNA and it's missing. So well, they uh, do do that to... because they're very expensive. Yeah, <laughs> they grow so legs every now and then. Port two. Yeah. So, and and the main thing with the two port is you can, you don't get as much crosstalk information as you would if you had four ports. Right. And once something leaves port one and shows up on the other guy's port two, that's crosstalk. So I'm so. still I'm still relying a lot on simulations for microwave board design because of that. I don't have. Ooh, we all rely on we simulations. Do a show on that. Uh, yeah. Well, are you using Give it Fox? six months. Give it six months. Yeah, six months. Right. What 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 tool are you using? I'm not going to say. I'm oh, not... Altium. <laughs> it's not Altium. Alt... Oh, okay. Altium it's... won't do it yet, but if I have my way, it will. Anyway, so um, very good. Uh, I'm out of things to talk about. Well, I, I just wanted to I just wanted to point out I do know there's a really fantastic. Um, I think it's based on open source, but not sure. But there is a VNA that's two and a half thousand dollars that goes up to six or seven gigahertz. That's handheld, and it's getting rave reviews. So um, that might be the ticket. Uh, and I'll okay. Oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of positivity around those, and even a lot of hams are poning up their own money, two and a half grand because and, of and what hams it can are do. notoriously. They they can be very thrifty yeah. for for accessories because they have all their money in a radio or you know even vice versa. But uh, hams were a fact of life back when I was growing up, and now I just don't see as much of it. Other than well, I think every hackaday writer went out and got his ham license just for the heck of it. Well, I can tell you what triggered that was Jerry Ellsworth got hers. So if, if it people did. Think it was if, the same time frame. If Jerry yeah. got her ham license, everyone's gonna so could I. go ahead and. <laughs> And frankly, I did it. Chris Carlson did it because we have our um, one of our staff members. Rob is a fantastic ham. He's been a ham for a long time, and a lot of our tech staff uh, are hams. They just don't really talk about it much because they're talking to each other on the air, not on YouTube. But that's changing. Right. <laughs> I think that's changing. YouTube for ham. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, it was great talking with you again you too, today. Bill. And it was great not having Echo. I think we didn't have Echo. As echo, far as I echo. can tell, it's all, it's all good. Now, do you have any questions? Um, I just think real quick before we wrap it up, there's some questions came in through the YouTube stream. Okay. Um, did you have any questions on Facebook we could answer for people? I, I don't see any. Uh, they're just mostly saying good to see you guys and stuff. So um, no no real questions from the yeah. from the people out there because you know people listen to me just because I, I BS a lot whereas they listen to you for actual information. Well, just just to respond to some of the comments on the uh, on the YouTube, uh, Valentin, I really appreciate your comments. You're saying you're unhappy with Altium Vault parts because they're all American. I'm paraphrasing. You said because it's there's no European symbols. So instead of having boxes for resistors, you've got squiggles. Um, Use one... the Yago library. It's all it's well, all European. Don't listen to Bill. <laughs> Use the Altium library. <laughs> there are there are variants. Um, yes. There's this one feature, and this is a topic for another discussion, another day. I want to show you guys how I use. I'll listen to Bill. Symbol. <laughs> listen to Bill for stories. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bill. And then, and then tune him out as soon as he's. 
No, I'm, go ahead. Go I'm, ahead. I'm, I'm, you know I'm. You know I love you, man. So, yes, um, yes. Uh, but but seriously, there's this feature in symbols called um, alternatives, and they're very powerful. And most, I'd say, ninety five percent of Altium users have no idea this feature exists. So I want to make sure you know about it because it's extremely okay. useful for this exact kind of thing. You can switch all your resistors to boxes. Uh, you can you can have you can build your own library with a symbol that's that has many different variations, but it's still all the same part and one symbol. But you can choose which variation based on what what it is you need it to be displayed and printed like. So. Um, uh, what else? Very Robert, cool. thank you for your comment. We'll do a power supply. The CE stands for controlled I explosion. I knew somebody was going to... I love yeah. that. That is so true. There are so many manufacturers who put CE on any, anything, but they just they just do it. We can't actually believe that they've done any testing. And CE is so generic. It could mean anything. It could mean a baby can't stick their finger through the hole. Well, so what? If it doesn't have an FCC logo on it, I don't trust the CE logo on well, it. It's, 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 and that's not always the case. It's, Put it yep. this way. If it has an FCC logo on it, then I can trust the CE usually. Well, but that's only for EMC and EMI, EM, electromagnetic well, I'm an compatibility. EMC person. So, yeah, yeah. If, if it's for safety, you've got... Safety, I... You must look for UL. You must look for the backwards RU. You must look for, um, and and it depends on the country. So, BDE yeah, well, for Germany, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. And all of these have very specific symbols that are very identifiable and trademarked. Um, what uh, is it in Australia? It's it's um, they merged them. There used to be two. There used to be an A tick and a C tick, and the A tick was for safety, and the C tick was for electromagnetic compatibility. Okay. Uh, and now it's just now it's all just an ATIC symbol, and okay. and um, so you're reading. And so, yeah, I am. I'm reading other comments, but actually, the people on the live stream answered each other, so that's wonderful. Glad to that's provide cool. a forum for you guys. Hey, by the way, you should be able to. See, we'll talk offline, but we should find a way to get that that particular YouTube stream on our stream, if that makes sense. Yes. The comments. Yeah. So my mine, there's no comments, but yours. It, let's get that one up there. So. We we, All right. we should. Yep. Well, thank you everyone for Excellent. joining us. Been been uh, been awesome. It's been today. a Friday. How's that? It's been a Friday. And please even <laughs> it's been a long week. Even after the stream, this this video will remain on our Altim Academy YouTube channel as well. So if if you didn't get to ask a question or you want us to cover other topics or tell us a joke that's clean, <laughs> please leave a comment below and uh, come back for us next time, either here on YouTube or on Bill's Facebook. Uh, and Bill, also you'll collect questions and comments from your Facebook stream, yep. I trust, and that'll... Help us know what, what we should be talking next about next time. time. Right. Yeah. Any other right. closing Excellent. comments? No, that's that's it. Unless somebody has a, a joke they need dirtified, send that in too and I'll I'll go ahead and dirtify it and but yes, it's great talking with everybody. Good seeing you again, Ben. Yeah, you too. And man. Uh, we'll see you next Friday, right? Yeah. Right here, two o'clock Eastern, eleven three in the morning, uh, your time zone, I think. <laughs> In Australia, maybe, but here in California, it's uh, yeah, California. Ele eleven a.m. Eleven a.m. California, two Eastern, and uh, look forward to seeing you again next week and chatting. It's always fun. Excellent, cool man. And we're out, as they say. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody.